Welcome back, everyone. <coughs> um, I think we've had a, an amazing morning uh, and early afternoon uh, so far. Uh, so again, like really fascinating talks. And uh, now we are here for the uh, lunchtime symposium. Uh, I'm uh, talking on behalf of uh, our experience with the uh, NEVA study, and uh, I'm the uh, UKPI for the NEVA 1 registry. So these are the results uh, from uh, the Royal London Hospital, uh, where we are based. These are my disclosures. So um, just briefly, the uh, Neva stent retriever is a sort of novel stent retriever. Many of us uh, have probably used it. It's got higher radial force, it had distal clock catcher, and it uh, comes in a variety of different sizes and lengths. And it has these uh, specifically designed uh, drop zones to try and let the clots uh, fall into uh, the, the uh, stent retriever. The latest edition uh, is the Neva Net, which I will uh, very briefly touch upon towards the end of the talk. So the Neva 1 registry is a, is a post-marketing uh, registry. Uh, I've said all comers, that's not strictly true, but um, <clears throat> on the whole, you know, if you meet uh, the, the typical trial uh, inclusion criteria, NIHSS, uh, sort of six or above, et cetera, uh, then, you, then you can be recruited into it. So these are the 30 patients that we've recruited, and that was our uh, initial recruitment target. Um, and uh, four of us have been uh, recruiting at the Royal London Hospital. Um, you can see that the majority of the patients are um, uh, female. The vast majority of patients, as with most trials, um, are MRS01 at baseline, with hypertension being the most common comorbidity. Patients are coming in with a relatively high median NIHSS score of sort of 16, 17, and about 40% of people uh, of our patients are uh, receiving TPA uh, according to the international guidelines. Uh, Cardioembolic um, and uh, large artery atherosclerosis uh, are the uh, most frequent causes of the um, strokes that we're seeing and that we're treating uh, generally within our population. But we see a reasonable amount of ICAD too. So uh, briefly, again, baseline imaging data, the uh, majority of the cases have been right-sided. Uh, can't really explain why there's uh, such a shift uh, away from sort of 50%. There um, must be something in the water in East London. Um, <clears throat> five cases were tandem lesions. The vast majority of cases that we've treated are uh, M1 occlusions, um, with, uh, interestingly, the average clot length is just under uh, two centimeters. So quite long clots, actually, that we're dealing with. Uh, the median aspect score was eight. Uh, as per standard technique, um, we do the vast majority of our cases with local anesthesia, uh, saving uh, general anesthesia mostly for posterior circulation, uh, or those patients who will simply uh, not cooperate with a, with a little bit of sedation. Um, Balloon guide catheters, I use a BGC for virtually all of my cases um, uh, for anterior circulation, as, do, uh, as does one of my colleagues, and I always use a DAC, uh, as does my colleague, uh, Dr. Wong. Whereas a couple of the guys who've been recruiting in, uh, they vary their approach. Sometimes they'll use a BJC, uh, but most of the time they'll be using a DAC if, if they haven't used a uh, balloon guide catheter. Um, interestingly, um, in our <coughs> sort of analysis, we, we're opting for uh, the longer devices, um, and I'll come on to why that may have had an effect with our results uh, slightly later. So I think this is the, um, perhaps the, 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 the money shot when it comes to what we're seeing. And um, I'm seeing, we are seeing in this 30 patients, uh, true first pass effect, so TIKI 2C3 in uh, close to 75% uh, with a modified first pass effect, so 2B, and I mean ETIKI 2B67 here. Um, so uh, ETIKI 2B um, or above uh, in just under 85% of cases. Uh, final uh, TIKI 2B uh, was uh, approaching 90, uh, sort of 93, 94%. So this, I was actually, have to say, quite surprised by uh, how good these results were, uh, because I was expecting to see uh, first pass effect in about 50 to 60%. But when I saw that we are hitting close to 75%, uh, I, was, um, I was quite happy, actually. <laughs> 
Distal embolization uh, we saw in about 16% of cases, and in that scenario we've used a smaller stent retrievers, and I'll show a case uh, where I went after a, a smaller SCA occlusion with a um, small three millimeter uh, uh, NV stent. Um, in one case, uh, the uh, Neva didn't work, um, and we had to try an alternative stent retriever, but that, that didn't work either, so I think it was just one of these uh, very difficult to remove clots that we occasionally face. No cases of uh, symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, and um, I think in part that might be due to uh, much better uh, control of blood pressure that we've been uh, aggressively managing uh, in our unit. So we try now to keep the blood pressure actually um, <clears throat> below 130 rather than 140, uh, somewhere between 110 to 130 if, um, if we think that, uh, or, or just uh, free, free blood pressure rather than aggressive management. Um, some uh, SAH uh, in about 20% of patients Typically, it's been quite small and localized in the sylvian fissure. Hasn't been huge uh, sort of subarachnoid hemorrhages that we've seen. So here's a case. Here's one of the recent cases, actually. It was the 39-year-old uh, uh, kebab shop worker that I mentioned earlier. Um, came in one hour of onset, an IHSS score of 12, with a PC aspect score of 10 on CT and a, and a mid-basilar occlusion under general anesthesia, because he was becoming very aggressive during the, um, during the assessment. Um, under general anesthesia, <clears throat> what we saw is um, uh, mid-basilar occlusion. As you can see, that very, the very flat cutoff that you sometimes see with, uh, with clots. Uh, straightforward passing it with uh, headway 21 and synchro wire, which is uh, essentially our standard approach, or my standard approach. Uh, and on um, first pass, that's a Neva, Neva um, 4.5 by 29 uh, in sight view here. You can see going up into the uh, right uh, PCA, P1. On first pass, uh, I, I quoted this as a 2B, and that's because there's an SCA occlusion here, and then there's a bit more of a distal PCA occlusion that you can't see. So that would have been modified first pass, not first pass effect. Then I went after the SCA occlusion with this uh, three, mil three by 20 SCA. It ended up all being open, you have to take my word. I left the uh, PCA occlusion, so I, I classified the score at the end uh, of the two passes as 2C, because it was a, a sort of P4 occlusion uh, in the PCA. And then interestingly, what I started to see uh, after just waiting uh, was the patient's uh, vessel started to collapse. Um, so he had underlying ICAD, so uh, balloon angioplasty and an atlas stent placed um, at the end of the procedure uh, with integral in um, bolus dose or followed by uh, aspirin and prazagrel. And um, <clears throat> please go and get your uh, uh, genetic test so that we know what we should give you. If, unfortunately, you end up in our lab uh, during brain conference. 24-hour scan, his NIHSS has dropped to zero, PC aspects remain 10, and the uh, atlas stent has remained open. Uh, here's another case in the anterior circulation, uh, you know, moderate to severe stroke, um, TPA given, this was a tandem lesion actually, so uh, angioplasty uh, to get the uh, balloon guide catheter across, uh, which often we don't have to do, but in this case it was a very heavily calcified uh, plaque, so I just couldn't track the, the BGC up. Uh, terminal ICA occlusion, again, Neva, the long Neva, first pass Tiki uh, three, and a couple of protégés overlapped uh, on the way out. Uh, no hemorrhage, um, good NIHSS drop, and I classified this as uh, aspects probably nine there. So currently we've got four publications uh, detailing people's experience uh, with the Neva device. And what we're seeing is from these publications, a first pass effect of, like I said, I was expecting about 40% with a modified first pass effect uh, in two thirds of cases. If we add our results to this, the first pass effect tips up a little bit, um, as does the modified first pass effect. But there seems to be quite a big difference between what we've seen um, with a close to 75% first pass effect compared to these previous studies. So I wanted to try and work out why. Um, 
that might be the case based on what's published and the data that I have. So I started looking at the, uh, at the papers to try to analyze what data could be gleaned uh, from these. Now, in terms of location, we had very similar distribution of locations in our series. Uh, we, don't, we don't really have that many M2s, and in this case, um, in this uh, series, uh, uh, by Borgraff et al., all of the cases were M, 100% uh, were M1, but they classified as proximal or distal. I didn't classify that our, paper, uh, our data into proximal or distal M1. Certainly, we've had distal M1 occlusions. Um, but I, I don't use the NEVA really to go after, let's say, mid M2 uh, lesions. None of them, unfortunately, reported uh, things that I think could uh, interfere with the results uh, or interfere with your TIGI scores, which are clot length, uh, nor uh, the appearance of the uh, clot uh, on plain CT or on MRI. So we didn't know if they were hyperdense or non-hyperdense, and we don't know anything about their clot length. Uh, we used a lot of balloon guide catheters, um, relatively speaking, whereas other centers are going much more for uh, DAX. So could those things be uh, interfering uh, and giving a, a better result for us? Certainly we're seeing with the NEVA study, um, at least our local experience, uh, you know, almost a doubling uh, in, the, in the first pass effect relative to other widely used uh, devices. So very nice, um, very nice first pass effect that we're seeing. So I mentioned that we uh, have generally opted for slightly longer stents, and that's, that's true actually for most stent retrievers that we, that we pick up. Um, I will go for the longer stent retriever wherever possible. Um, that's because there's numerous studies looking at uh, various different devices that suggest that longer stent retrievers are beneficial for first pass effect. And we've seen numerous videos here of the clot rolling, not engaging, and so if you have more stent retriever distal to the clot, you just have more of an interaction and more of an ability to capture that clot if it is rolling, uh, if it is not fully integrated within the stent. So from my point of view, I personally think that longer stent retrievers where possible and where safe to use should be used for the sorts of ICA and M1 occlusions that we uh, are routinely facing. Now, there was a nice paper published quite recently um, by uh, Bella Chu um, and colleagues, and basically what they looked at was the ratio of the stent length uh, to the clot length, which is obviously the thing that you really want to know. Um, and they showed that the longer the ratio um, of uh, SR length compared to clot length, the, the, the higher your chance of first pass effect. So again, maximizing that interaction between the stent and the clot. So if it does roll, if you do lose control of the clot on you, as you're dragging, then you, know, you have uh, more of a chance to grab the clot uh, with the distal part of your stent. Could the, could the physical properties um, of the uh, NEVA device also assist in that capturing if you, if you lose at the proximal end? Possibly. It has a higher radial force. It has these drop zones. Um, maybe the higher radial force means that even if you're pulling slowly uh, and the clot is somehow lost, for example, that higher radial force can pin the clot a bit better between the vessel, between the stent, or that the interaction between the stent strut and the clot is a little bit faster because of that radial force interaction. I'm not really sure, it's a possibility, and I think it's something that we probably need to uh, try to deduce and try to look at. Some of the other things that we, have, uh, that we routinely do um, when we perform mechanical thrombectomy is, certainly myself, I tend to wait almost as a ma mandatory thing five minutes. I normally put on some music, and I think some of my colleagues are here. They're sick to death of hearing Christmas music now whilst I'm waiting for the stent retriever to embed. Um, I think, um, and as I said, the balloon guide catheter uh, is, is mandatory. So are all of these things coming into play? And the last thing that I would say is to why perhaps our results are maybe a little bit different to what the other groups have seen. Um, could be that the vast majority of the clots that, were, that we were faced with in our registry, and this, this was not a selection bias, we, it was all comers, um, but the vast majority were hyperdense. So 
are, the, are we seeing this high ticky uh, score at first pass? Because the majority of our clots have been the red blood cell rich clots. Uh, I can't really say uh, one way or another. And I think my feeling is, is that these results are very good. I'm keen to continue using the device. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if we, we get mean reversion and the higher the numbers that we enroll, so it's sort of the first pass effect starts to come down closer to sort of 55, 60%. But we'll see. So what's next? Um, <clears throat> the NevaNet uh, is the, uh, the latest iteration um, and a very novel uh, addition to the Neva range and actually to stent retrievers in general. And the question really is, is will this help uh, recanalization and reperfusion. And we should remember that sometimes we're using these terms interchangeably, but, they, but they're not really the same, and Tommy will hopefully give us a, uh, an excellent lecture tomorrow on the difference between reperfusion and recanalization. But recanalization is essentially opening the blood vessel, and reperfusion is occurring at the tissue level. And they kind of are synonymous, but not 100%. So we should try to be, wherever possible, precise in what we are doing. Now, we all know that during uh, mechanical thrombectomies, um, and actually even during, for example, uh, angiography or, or coiling and things like this, we can have iatrogenic embolizations. So there was a very nice paper that's actually been uh, mentioned earlier uh, by uh, Luis Sebastiano's group, uh, where they were using cadaveric models, and they were looking at uh, how microclots can occur, how, uh, how iatrogenic embolization occurs, when it occurs, um, all of these sorts of things. And it's a very, very good paper with some very nice videos that come as supplementary. So I would uh, strongly recommend any of you who haven't seen this to, to try and uh, get hold of it. But what they showed was during the crossing, you can have iatrogenic embolization. During the deployment, uh, of the stent retriever as you, as the stent retriever expands and then you get a rush of blood hopefully going past potentially, that can send off um, iatrogenic embolization. What about when you're pulling and you start to fracture the clot and break the clot, then you can have uh, iatrogenic embolization. And I think all of these sorts of things are very interesting because like, like I said when when I opened the conference, it's sometimes we think we know what we're doing. Sometimes we think we know much more than we actually do. And for me, one of the things when I read this paper and, and started to consider what it was talking about was, well, for example, a lot of people will say use a 21 instead of a 27 microcatheter, fine. But maybe we should actually inflate the balloon before we cross the uh, microcatheter. Maybe we should turn on the, the suction, not to full power, but mildly, not at the clot, cl uh, clot face, but just proximally. So if you do deploy the stent, rather than the microfragments going distally, maybe you can pull them out, or maybe you stop that from occurring. It's just stuff to consider, rather than any sort of um, uh, recommendation that I can make at the moment. But those sorts of things, we to optimize the techniques, I think are, are worth, um, worth some thought. Now, I don't know if people, uh, I don't know what people's uh, take on choice was, uh, but uh, to me, actually, this came, I think, as relatively obvious. Um, but I liked, I liked what they did. I liked, again, the fact that they're looking at something different. They're presuming um, that uh, recanalization, or rather than presuming, they are acknowledging that recanalization and reperfusion are two different things. And so, what they showed, obviously, as I'm sure we're all aware, is um, TPA given at the end of the procedure um, actually led to quite significant changes in outcomes. So the TPA group had much better outcomes. The thing that I thought was actually most interesting was that there was not a significant change in the vast majority of patients in the actual TIKI score. So are we dealing here with this microthrombus problem, this microclot formation that may be occurring prior to the mechanical thrombectomy because of stasis, uh, because of collapse of uh, collateral vessels, et cetera? Is it occurring during uh, the actual procedure? In all likelihood, it's probably a combination of things. So potentially, by mitigating any microthrombosis and microclot formation during the procedure, maybe we can actually, again, further improve the outcomes. 
There's still more work to be done on this because ultimately what we want to know is if you get TIKI 2C or 3 and you give TPA, do you see, do you see an improvement at that level? Who knows? But let's, uh, let's wait for these sorts of results to, to filter down into clinical practice and wait for the major studies. Maybe the net, as you can probably deduce, maybe the net will help with this. Maybe it will trap those microclots. Maybe it will protect the distal circulation from all of these uh, fragmented uh, bits and pieces that get created uh, during the procedure. And we'll be hoping, hopefully hearing from uh, Zhao Wei later on the uh, preclinical tests that we've done uh, with Mark Ribot uh, to look at this very problem. Personally, I think, again, coming back to our results that we are seeing, you know, the balloon guide catheter, in my, in my interpretation, and I trained with Tommy, um, it can't be replaced yet. It, it cannot be replaced in my interpretation. Uh, I'm a belt and braces kind of guy. I go after the clot with everything. So balloon guide catheter, uh, distal aspiration catheter, and then, you know, whichever stent retriever I think is going to be best for the job. And the Neva is climbing up the um, ladder uh, to <laughs> pretty, pretty much soon be one of the, one of the ones I'll go to uh, almost immediately. So this is my first experience with the uh, Neva net. Uh, as you can see, a terminal ICA extending into the M1 uh, in this patient. He needed a GA. Uh, because, again, he's behaving quite erratically. Uh, that's the, the net there. You can see it's kind of, uh, it's a bit like a squashed web um, in the vessel. What, what I did there is, uh, as I often do, is not pull into the uh, Sophia, but did a sort of more badass technique with the balloon inflated, pulling the whole system out uh, in one go. There's, the, uh, there's the, the clot trap there, a bit more caught there, and probably something uh, trapped there in the... Uh, in the actual uh, net uh, seen at the end. Unfortunately, the patient still had a pretty big uh, stroke, but nice, uh, a nice uh, final result there. So that's basically our experience of uh, the Neva. Uh, very limited experience of one case so far of Neva net. Will it, be, uh, will it give us better results over what we're seeing uh, with the uh, standard Neva device? I think hopefully yes, but um, I'm willing to be proven either correct or wrong uh, in the future. So thank you very much. Any questions? I have a question. Did you all enjoy lunch? Because okay. if you haven't, go and eat some more and then we'll come back. And the results from the registry? Uh, the total registry, you mean? No, not yet. Not yet. These are only my uh, 30 cases so far. So, um, when, what do you reckon? Uh, when do you think that will be ready? Ali. I, I do have a uh, question maybe for, for the audience. Anybody is mm -hmm. using TPA routinely after successful recanalization? What's your thoughts on that? Mm. Yep. How, what's your approach? How much do you give? Do you do a dynasty or whatever CT before? Uh, okay. So if it's negative, then you infuse. And how much you do infuse? So you don't go by weight. Do you? You go by weight? Mm. And so, go over how long? Okay. So I have a question. Um, so you, presumably you do the Dyna CT to exclude a major subarach, right? Okay. Do you think it's worthwhile doing a perfusion scan? Because what we really want to know is, do we think that there is loss of tissue perfusion um, before you give the TPA? Do you think it's worthwhile doing some sort of perfusion scan on the table? I, I don't know what machine you have. We, we don't have that capability, unfortunately. But, but I thought that you were not going to see anything on, this, on the perfusion. I thought it's going to be at the microcirculation. Sorry, say that again. Uh, my understanding is that from the paper, 
you know, the one that was, you were referencing is that you're not going to see anything on the perfusion scan most mm. of the times because it's, the problem is that the microcirculation. Is, but, is that a correct statement? What's your no, advice on that? I don't, so the problem is, is I don't think we can say that based on the existing choice because um, they, what we really want to know is if you get TIKI-3, which is TIKI-3 recanalization, we don't know what that's doing at the reperfusion level. So I wonder whether or not if you do a perfusion scan afterwards, and there's, I think Tommy will talk about this tomorrow, there's, there's some papers, uh, Mark Ribot's group has certainly published one, where you will get um, good, you know, good recanalization, but you don't see reperfusion. So it's, it's, it's futile reper, it's futile recanalization. And the cardiologists have talked about this for a long time. So they, they get great recanalization, but there's no tissue reperfusion. And so I wonder whether what we should potentially be doing is, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to use perfusion pre, but should we use perfusion post to then guide TPA? I, I don't know. So the, the next question is that if you see angiographically mm. a capillary fill, mm. is that it's not going to be filling on CT perfusion? That's the question. Yeah. Do we I, have any data about yeah. that? Yeah, no, not to my knowledge. Hi, sorry, I've got a Can question. Um, it's probably uh, more to do with the registry. I'm not sure if you, you might be aware of it. Uh, the question was more on how uh, distal emboli or embolized immune territory are detected in the registry. Is it based on, uh, you know, catheter angiography outcomes? Is it based on MRI, CT? Uh, ca catheter angio. So it's, it's basically standard practice. So, you know, um, we don't have uh, access to MRI ever. <laughs> um, Pre or post, it's quite hard to get an MR. Uh, I was actually amazed. The only reason I got an MR for that uh, that Basler patient was because the MR technician was in the hospital at the time. Uh, otherwise, I would have just gone um, straight to uh, straight to the angio lab with that guy. Anything else? 